Roundtable Series of the Aspen Institute and the Michelle Smith and Robert H. Smith Foundation. We thank you for being here. Uh, a lot of us are very interested in the politics of the next couple of weeks as an old politician myself, and I see some old politicians up front. There's uh, Congressman and Ambassador Tim Romer, Senator Bennett Johnston, Congressman Baron Hill, and uh, I, I know that uh, there are uh, uh, others as well anyway, so uh, we appreciate folks being here. Also, I recognize Gary Nell, who's president of National Public Radio, who's here, and a friend of mine, delighted that he's here. And um, we just have a great program. I wake up to Steve Inskeep, and I, um, that soothing, wonderful voice, I would tell everybody, it doesn't put me to sleep. It enlivens me. It enriches my life every single day that you're on. But uh, you do a great job. And I'm going to let Steve introduce uh, Charlie Cook with the Cook Political Report, NBC, Amy Walter, uh, political director of ABC. They're both terrific. I would say that uh, one mention about Charlie, his son just came back from Afghanistan just in the last couple of days, last month. He was in the 82nd Airborne, and I'm sure that Charlie is delighted that he's back safely, and we all are as well. So any event, uh, uh, Steve, of course, is co-host of Morning Edition. He's an uh, author and He's uh, been involved in a lot of issues, uh, reporting on the Middle East, international affairs, and, of course, domestic policy as well. So I'm going to turn the program over to Steve. We'll have about 30 to 40 minutes worth of, of questions from you, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for their Q&A. So, Steve, go ahead. Secretary Glickman, thank you very much. Thanks for the honor of the invitation from the Aspen Institute. It's an honor to talk to both of you folks. Uh, I grew up watching ABC News. Uh, I continue to pay attention to ABC's reporting, so it's great to, to meet Amy Walter, the person who I'm sure tells George Stephanopoulos what to do. Everything. Right, yes. everything. Jake Tapper tells him everything. what to do, everything. Absolutely. Whatever they say, it's just from right. her brain to their mouth and on out into the on out into the ether. When I first moved to Washington in 1996, very early on I had some political question I was putting to a colleague uh, and they said, you really ought to just call up Charlie Cook because he knows more than anybody else about that. Uh, it was true then, it continues to be true now, and it's great to be on stage with you, uh, Mr. Cook, as well. I should mention, for those who don't know, that he uh, is editor of the Cook Political Report and a columnist for the National Journal. Uh, I want to begin with a really straightforward question. I'm sure the answer is really, really simple. Yeah. Here we are two weeks from the presidential election. Who's winning? <laughs> He really had to put that out there, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, yeah. Just like that. Ladies first. Yeah, I knew that was, that was great. Thanks. So you look at the news coverage and you look at the data and you get kind of two different answers. Right? If you look at the news coverage, especially since that first debate in Denver, the it would be Romney's now the guy who's ascendant after a terrible summer and terrible September and what looked like a race that was a runaway Obama victory now, the momentum's all with Mitt Romney. Look at some of these polls, some of these national polls. He's, he was ahead. There was a Pew poll right after the, um, or immediately, not immediately after, few but soon, after. a few yeah. days after that first de de debate in Denver. Other polls showing the race now with dead heat. Momentum is going his way. And then you look at the data, especially, and we're going to get to this in a minute, in these states, because as, as we all learned, if we didn't learn it in school in two, in, uh, earlier in our lives, we learned in 2000 that people don't elect the president. The Electoral College elects the president. And when you look at those polls, the underneath numbers suggest that it's uh, still Obama's race right now, that fundamentally he has got an edge in this Electoral College map in some of those big states like Ohio and Wisconsin, Nevada especially, and that his path to victory has been, always been, um, he's had multiple paths, whereas Romney has really decided early on that they're, they were going to try to fight on the same path rather than trying to expand it. So the fact that Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota, states that they talked about putting in play, they've not, never spent a dime there means that it all comes down to those firewall states. I, I hear you telling me, uh, then we'll get Charlie's uh, perspective on this in a moment, I hear you telling me that even though if I look at a list of polls, it may show Romney plus two, Romney plus five, Romney plus one, there are a lot of Obama-leaning uh, right. polls as well. But, but even though I look at those polls, you're telling me that it sounds like Obama has the edge and who's actually going to win if the election. If you look structurally, he has an advantage right now. Now, if those states happen to flip, they have gotten closer. And there's a debate, of course, and Charlie, I know we'll have a lot to say about this, about 
what polls to believe in. Are polls even trustworthy now? Everybody seems to have their own poll. I don't know that there are actually that many people in Ohio. I feel like maybe there are professional poll takers in Ohio. And if so, that would be a great business if you want to get in. Oh, sure, I'll answer your poll, five bucks. Um, so there's so much data coming out of there that you almost don't know what to believe. So you have to sort of read what's happening from the campaigns. And it's pretty clear that there is, again, when you talk about just a few of these states, and we can go through them, where the, the Obama edge, as slight as it may be, is still there. Um, so that's where we sort of leave things at this moment. Charlie Cook, who's winning? Well, first let me just say how much uh, I appreciate. Uh, every time I've ever done anything with the Aspen Institute, it's been a wonderful experience. The so one time I took my son out to the Global Strategy Conference in Aspen, and uh, Let's see, over there was Bob Gates before he was uh, CIA director, and over there's Al Gore, and here's George <laughs> Soros, and you know, just, and here I am from Shreveport, and thank you, wow, how did I get here? But anyway, the Aspen Institute is wonderful, and my old boss, Bennett Johnston, who I got my start working for a Senate, a Senate race in 1972, is sitting here. Uh, so anyway, thanks. Um, I, the way I would look at it is the popular vote, the national polls, I think it's about even right now, and, and we, I do want to get into a conversation of polls. But uh, I agree with Amy that the electoral college situation looks a little different, and, and it is more uphill for, for, for Romney. The way I would describe it is this. Um, first of all, President Obama was on the verge of putting this race away going in the first debate. I mean, it was, it was all but done. Mm -hmm. and, and you had a lot of voters that just weren't even considering thinking about <laughs> voted, uh, co considering Mitt Romney, but weren't terribly enthusiastic about President Obama. And so suddenly it pushes Romney up into the race, Obama drops, and then there's even the next two debates that President Obama technically won, but the feeling it sort of opened the doors for people considering Romney in a way that they had never considered him before. So nationally, this is a very, very, very close race, uh, effectively tied. But I, I think that the, there is a lot of scar tissue in the six, seven swing states that, uh, that saw the brunt of the Bain, adver Bain capital, uh, plant, clo plant closings, layoffs, outsourcing, income tax, Cayman Islands, Switzerland, Bermuda, all that stuff. Um, I think the, the Romney campaign, I think, made a, a, a huge error by not going in early on as soon as they nailed down the nomination and created, you know, tried to project a positive image, tell people about Mitt Romney. He was a blank piece of paper. And, and, and instead, I mean, to me, one of the things you've got to do is define your candidate before the other side defines him. And to make people, I mean, think of the Boy Scout oath, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, brave, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Oh, the, thrifty always, the thrifty always hung me up. But you really want to create a reservoir of goodwill and a Teflon coating before the slime hits. And the Romney campaign opted not to do that. Their view was any day, any dollar spent talking about anything other than the economy was a day or a dollar wasted. And so the Obama came, campaign went in and Priorities USA, the pro-Obama super PAC, they basically went in the swing states with a baseball bat and beat Romney's brains in. And so there's still a lot of scar tissue. So after that first debate, Romney goes up. I'm sure his numbers went up in all 50 states but there are about six or seven that they went up less in because of that scar tissue. And now, has it, uh, and, and so, you know, even if you assume that Romney takes North Carolina and Virginia's about even and Florida's about even, but even, you know, you, it's a tough path for him to get to 270. And, you know, it, uh, you know Ohio, Iowa, Colorado, uh, Wisconsin, um, there's a lot of scar tissue there. And so that's why it's uphill for Romney, even though it is an incredibly close race. Um, so that raises a question that people have been talking about in recent days. Is there a legitimate possibility that one candidate wins the popular vote, the other wins the electoral vote? There is. Right? Yeah. Um, especially because look at those states that are red. If you run up the score in a place like Texas, right? there are a lot of people that live there. Mm -hmm. you, if you do win Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, even Ohio, remember he could, he could win all of those, Mitt Romney, and still lose. 
a lot of people live there. And then look at the blue states, and this is where the Romney campaign also says they are doing much better, and the polls suggest this too. They're not going to lose by the same margins that John McCain did, even in a place like Illinois, right, where uh, McCain <laughs> lost some of these districts by 20 points. Isn't, that's not gonna happen this year. So you can see those numbers going up, even in states that Romney will lose. But because some of the states are completely off the map, places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, that means his pathway, again, has to go through a place like Colorado, Nevada, or Ohio. You know, one of the problems with writing a column a couple times a week is you're sort of on the record. And, <laughs> and a few months ago, I wrote a column, and I was talking about all these people that are spending so much time parsing together combinations of electoral votes like they were trying to solve a Rubik's Cube or something. Mm -hmm. and, and I pointed out that, look, in 53 out of 56 presidential elections, the popular vote and the electoral vote have gone the same way. And that works out to 95%. And so could it happen? Of course it could happen, but it's very, very unlikely. But now, I, I think that there's a fair chance of that, and, and if that happens, Romney would be the one that would be more likely to come out on the popular vote side and Obama on the electoral vote side because of exactly what we're talking about. So I think all those Republicans that saw a great, great benefit in, in the Electoral College back in 2000 um, may be rethinking that and vice versa for liberals on the other side. I, I'm glad you mentioned 2000 because one thing that I do remember about the 2000 campaign was that there was also at that time talk of the possibility of a split between the popular and electoral vote. But the talk was, as I recall it, that Al Gore was surely going to lose the popular vote but still had a shot at the electoral vote. It turned out to be the opposite. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something to remember now, because even though we're talking about this possibility, you see it as a real possibility, isn't, isn't, aren't the odds still against that really happening? Well, yeah, maybe, I mean, I, I, we're talking about something that's maybe a 10% chance, okay. 10, 15% chance. But the thing is, statistically, it ought to be just a five. So it's greater than it normally is. I mean, if you didn't even know who the candidates were or anything, you, I would assume, normally, that a Democrat would be better off in the popular vote because they run up the score in enormously populous states like California and New York. And while really the only very populous state that Republicans run up the score is Texas. And so Democrats waste more votes than Republicans do. So to me, that would be the norm if you had a, split, a divided electoral popular vote. But this time, it, this time is different. If, if, if it happens this time, it would be more likely to go the other way because of the Electoral College difficulties that we're, we're talking about that, that Romney has. Okay, I want to mention Amy talked about uh, Pennsylvania's being off the map. Actually, for whatever reason, the electoral map that we have here, Pennsylvania is put it's, as a it's, swing state. Right. I know some electoral maps have it that way, but if you want at any point, grab the uh, I was look, you know, in politics as in life, follow the money, right? So if a campaign has spent approximately zero dollars on television, in a state that says to me that they are not invested in that state and consider it a battleground state. And that's exactly what has happened. The Romney campaign, they talk about they have people on the ground there and you know organization. That's nice. But nobody has put a dime from either campaign recently. The Obama campaign was up in terms of advertising. Some of the outside groups put a little bit of money in there, but very little. And, and that, to me, you know, again, you just figure out where most of this money is going. I mean, the, again, the poor people of Ohio um, have been <laughs> inundated for months. And I completely agree with Charlie, which was when you saw these ads going up, just going after Bain and Mitt Romney, you said, well, surely we're going to get a response ad from the Romney campaign about you know, here's what a good guy he is, or here's what his business experience was. And, you know, Charlie and I got, listened to some of the same focus groups, and we'd hear it over and over again, where you had these swing voters disappointed in President Obama, but they kept saying, I just don't know anything about Mitt Romney. And then sometimes they would just say things, off, without being prompted, that were from ads. You know, I remember sitting in one group where a woman said, yeah, I mean, that Mitt Romney, he's a businessman and everything. I think that could be good. We have a, problems with our economy, but didn't he like shut factories down and stuff? And then in Vir Northern Virginia, where swing voters are these suburban women out in the suburbs, number of women talking about, yeah, you know, Romney, the economy, I think he could do a good job, but 
really worried about like women's health care stuff. Why, why is he doing that with abortion and stuff? So it was penetrating, and there was no, and the outside groups, I mean, for all the talk we're going to have about Citizens United and the, and the influx of money from these outside groups, two things to remember. One, they don't get as much bang for their buck as the campaign does. If you look at how much spending, even this week, where we've talked about the massive amount of money going in from outside groups, they're, the Obama campaign has more ads on television than all the Republicans combined. Um, that's number one. And number two, all of those ads that the Republicans put up were negative too, right? So nobody was giving any cover to Mitt Romney. And when I talked to one of them the other day, because they're now putting up these positive spots about here was Mitt Romney with the, the boy that we heard about during the convention who died of cancer, and Mitt Romney was with him and helped him pick out his Boy Scout uniform to wear to his own funeral. Well, you know, it's a really touching story. Why did we never hear this story before? And I asked them about it. They said, well, we didn't know about that story until the convention, right? That's the problem of being an outside group. You don't know your own candidate because the candidate's the one supposed to be telling that story. There was an Obama ad that's just been airing in the last few days that has one of the most brutal taglines that I've seen. Mitt Romney, not one of us, uh, airing in Ohio. I mean, that's, some, that, that, that is in its, that, that's an alienating line, literally. It's hard to imagine. Well, and if a Republican had run that ad, yeah. I think we know what the interpretation of it might be. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah. And it's, and, but, it, but it sounds, to, well, no, it's, it's, it's an outstanding point. And it sounds like that is what you're saying. He, he, they would not have gotten away with running an ad like that about Mitt Romney had the ground been prepared in a different way. That's what you're saying. It wouldn't, wouldn't resonate, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, you know, where they've done the most effective job, we've, we see this in our national polling that we just got out of the field with. And if you look at, place like Ohio, um, where Mitt Romney's closed the gap on who do you think would do a better job in the economy. He's tied in this most recent Ohio um, Quinnipiac poll. But on who do you think represents middle class values, there's still like a 14 or 16 point gap there. So there are people saying, I know he's, he's good at what he does. Obviously, he made a lot of money. And that's good, I guess, except that <coughs> is he going to make a lot of money and then think about me? Right? Like, how am I going to be part of this equation? But at the same time, coming out of the debates, um, you know, NBC and the Wall Street Journal had a survey and they asked, you know, who has a plan uh, for the future and to create jobs. And while the net numbers improved somewhat for Romney, when you looked among independents, you know, it soared like 20 something points. I mean, we're, the thing is that Romney hasn't closed the sale right. with these people, but he's opened up the conversation. That's right. And in one of these, uh, Peter Hart focus group in Columbus, Ohio, from, uh, I think it was on October 10th, yeah. uh, that was fascinating, where uh, this one woman said, I, I look at Romney through new eyes. Now, yeah. she was still undecided, but she was looking. And, and that's what's different from where things were back, you know, because he had, Amy said, mentioned this before, I mean, Romney had a horrible summer. He had a horrible trip to Europe. The convention, he got one lousy point bounce out of it. September was horrible. The 47% was a disaster. Basically, until October 1st, after winning the nomination, nothing went right. But then you had that debate on October 3rd, and um, yep. October was exactly. a great month for it. Amy mentioned early on something that I want to follow up on. You talked about the narrative, basically. You referred to the fact that everyone, is, everyone went through the events you just described, Charlie Cook, and then after the first debate, the narrative changed. It's been a narrative of Romney on the rise. The question is how long uh, people in the media will stick with that or if they stick with it through the election or what will happen. How important a factor is that in the real world simply the way that political reporters assume the story is going and the way that they cast their stories as a result? I, in terms of swing voters, undecided slash independent slash swing voters, I don't think they're hearing it at all. I mean, the thing about it is undes independent voters typically read newspapers less they watch television news less, they listen to NPR less, they, I mean, they, they don't follow, well, the way I would put it is this, conservatives and Republicans have passion, liberals and Democrats have passion, moderates and independents have lies, 
And they are not, they're not spending their lunch hour in a room here in Washington hearing discussion about this or watching on C-SPAN. I mean, they're, they're no offense. spending through. No offense. Yeah. But, but people, you know, they, they this politics, they, they typically don't like politics. They don't like politicians. They're very cynical about Washington, and they show up for one of two reasons, either out of a civic obligation or they're angry at somebody or, or a bunch of people or one whole side. And so, frankly, all this blather, I mean, they're not, they're not watching Fox and they're not watching MSNBC. And so much of the chatter that's going on, it, it's going past these people, the people that really make a difference because they're not watching Rachel and they're not watching Sean Hannity. I mean, that's not where independents, moderates, undecided voters live. Although I still wonder, Dave Weigel, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, of Slate wrote the other day about the, the way that the narrative changes. I mean, p basically political reporters take a look at the polls and write their stories. They're like a bunch of birds on a telephone line. And when one takes off, they all follow. No offense, again. But, um, <laughs> no, I don't care. Yeah, offense, sure. Okay, fine, fine. But he pointed out, <laughs> Obama gets out there and says, Romnesia, to describe Romney supposedly forgetting his past positions. And if you perceive Obama as winning, that's a great dig. And if you perceive Obama Obama is losing, it's an embarrassing sign of desperation. It seems to color, once, once independent voters do get around to paying attention to the news, does it color the news that they get? Well, and again, it does depend on, are they getting the news by watching something on Saturday Night Live, right? Which we use as a great arbiter of now, where a lot of folks who are very passive, and I completely agree with Charlie on the, you know, you are all wonderful people, but no one in this room is normal, right? Um, <laughs> including people on this panel in terms of what we spend our time. We just spent how many minutes talking about the possibility of a popular electoral vote split? I'd love to go poll people around America how many times they've actually thought about that in their lives. Um, so anyway, uh, so that show, for many people who are like passively watching this race, does give them an image of that. And look, the image that was created, was crafted of Mitt Romney, both on the comedy shows and then in, in traditional media, and of course by the ads, was that Mitt Romney was kind of, first of all, he's sort of stiff, but also that he's the super rich guy that doesn't really know what it's like to be an average person. And that's what you hear in those focus groups too, um, the Peter Hart ones especially, where he goes there and he asks, okay, so what would Mitt Romney be like as a neighbor, all right? They, they said things like, I don't, I'm sure he'd be nice and pleasant and everything, but I don't think I'd be good enough to be invited to his house. You know what I mean? Like, he's going to have a really big house, and I'd be kind of embarrassed bringing the casserole but over. who do they say they'd most like to have come to a backyard cookout of the four people Come on, you guys know who this is. Who do they want? Joe oh, Biden. Joe Biden, because he'd bring the beer, and he'd have a great time. Yeah. Everybody would have a great time. And yeah. Woo-hoo! It would be th so I fun. That was, I thought that was awesome. Oh, and they would also love Bill Clinton to come by. Yeah. They yeah. love yeah. Bill Clinton. They yeah. love Joe Biden. Um, and they think that, you know, gosh, I would. So, um, and, and, and Charlie's point is, a, is, is right on about, that's why this race isn't over. Okay, now why it is so close, but is the fact that the door did open after those debates, and there are a lot of people getting a second look at what they see from Mitt Romney. But the question, and this goes back to the earlier point that Charlie made about you know defining yourself, what is the closing argument then that Mitt Romney is making to them? And for many of them, they're saying, okay, things aren't getting all that much better, or they are getting a little bit better, but I don't know that I give Obama much credit for it. But if I'm going to switch horses, what do I get in a Mitt Romney? And they still haven't really answered that question. And one, one of the things we haven't talked about is, is sort of which Mitt Romney. The, the guy that came by our office, and I don't say that in a pejorative way at all, but the guy that came by that, you know, running for the U.S. Senate in 1994, uh, very bright, analytical mind. You could tell he was sort of more of a problem solver, that uh, here was a management consultant who was saying, you know, I'd like to get my hands on this government thing. I think I could do a better job. And I would have characterized him as fairly non-ideological. I mean, if I had to put him on a scale, a football field, I guess I'd probably put him around the 35, 40 yard line on the right side, but nowhere near the red zone. And, 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 and you know, that's the guy that was then. And that's the guy that started running for president in 2007. And then somewhere during the 2008 campaign, I think he realized that plan A wasn't working and that he had to go hard right. 
And so for the last four years, he had been running as far to the right as he possibly could, and that's what he had to do to win the nomination. And when you had that Fox News debate back in September of last year, where they said, you know, if you were offered a budget deal 10 to 1, $10 in spending cuts for a dollar in tax increases, would you go? And not one of the eight Republican candidates raised their hands, not even Huntsman or, or, or Romney. And the thing about it is, I mean, 10 to 1, that's a hell of a deal, but raising his hand would effectively be cutting his own throat. And so the thing is, he really didn't pivot back until the first, not even at the convention that much. Nope. It was really the at first the, first, the first debate. And so this was a different Romney. And, and people have to sort out for themselves, you know, which, what, which, you know, which is it. To me, this is closer to 1.0. But uh, uh, they, th that meant Romney could win a general election, but couldn't win a nomination. The other Mitt Romney could win a nomination, although, you know, it was a struggle, but, but couldn't possibly win a general election. Well, let me ask about his opponent here, because you've described Mitt Romney uh, doing a lot of things that you, just looking at it professionally, do not think is necessarily the ideal behavior, having an effective campaign run against him, having a terrible summer, having a terrible September, the 47 percent. Uh, and after all that, the president, with all the advantages of incumbency, was only up three or four points had one bad night, and even that lead goes away. What does that say about the president's position? Well, if we'd gone back six months ago, you look at the economy, you say, incumbent presidents don't get reelected with economies like this. And so the fact that Romney was behind with a lousy, with a, a, a lousy economy was really quite remarkable. Now, I think you also had, starting in August, September, a period of time where the stock market hit near a five-year high. Consumer confidence started shooting up. Now, granted, the stock market was moving up more because of the Fed and anticipation of Fed moves and things, but the housing market finally started shine, shines of life. Consumer confidence jumps up, and we started seeing in the polls that Amy and I follow so closely, right direction, wrong track right direction moving up, wrong track coming down. And you have some arguments that the economy actually would lean toward an Obama win narrowly at this well, point. Well, it was, Leonardo, uh, I would say it was the millstone around his neck was getting lighter. A lighter okay. yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wouldn't, no, it wasn't going to be an asset, uh, but it was less of a liability, and that was sort of, and then 47 percent was that, you could, you could look at the polls and see what day that happened. Um, it, it really, and, and, and where it hit, my colleague at National Journal, Ron Brownstein, did a lot of data of, of looking through the data. It said it was non-college educated white women that took a huge dip um, after that 47% remark. And that that's been, that was a group that was holding out. Non-college educated white voters are a problem for the president. Non-college educated white men is like a no-fly zone for the president. But the, the women were sort of more, they didn't really like Obama, but they weren't comfortable with Romney and 47% really hurt. But after the debate, you start seeing some of them so, moving on. So what does that say about the strengths or weaknesses of the president as a candidate, that he has had an improving economy, has the advantages of incumbency, had these advantages in the campaign, and here he is in so a very So here, here is the issue. So he has two things, I think, that are working against him. The economy is one, but the other is, and this is especially true for these suburban women we keep hearing about in Denver, here in Virginia, Columbus, Ohio, that he was going to change Washington, right? That people voted for this guy. I remember talking to people, especially out in the exurbs of Virginia, who said, I don't know, I, you, I can't believe I voted for a Democrat. I've never done this before, but I really believe that he's going to be able to change the way that this place works. Not completely, but he's going to make some inroads. And so it's the frustration that he said he was going to go and make things better, and it's a hundred times worse. Congress is much more polarized than ever. And so what you keep hearing from them is, okay, I get it. Like, maybe the economy's improving. Things are getting a little bit better. But why are the next four years going to be any different than the previous four years? How, how are you going to actually work with this Congress that you seem to have now completely dismissed? And that, in that Wall Street Journal poll, was fascinating. And they asked the question, okay, so if Obama's reelected, what percentage of you want to see major changes, minor changes, no change at all during his next four years? 62% said major changes. So, you know, this is, this is a group of, there are a group of people out there, again, take away the partisans, the hard partisans on either side, 
who are going to very reluctantly pick the next leader of the free world. This is not out of passion. This is not out of thinking things are going to change. It's sort of the least bad option. You know, the, the thing that disappointed me the most, just sort of as a, a somewhat more informed citizen than, than I mean, we, have, we, we all three of us have an unusual vantage point living here and watching so closely. But watching the president's acceptance speech and through the three debates, I kept waiting to hear him say, you know, I have some regrets about how I've handled things. And if reelected, I would like to do some, diff some things differently. And the fact is, this president has virtually no relationship with Congress. I mean, when Politico ran a, a piece back in May that pointed out that the president had not had a single conversation in person or on the phone with Kent Conrad, the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, or Tom Harkin, the chairman of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, Pension Committee, which also does student loans, not a single on the phone or in Would George person. W. Bush have been different, or Ronald Reagan? I've had Democratic committee, well, I don't want to get too specific. <laughs> in the Clinton administration and both Bush administrations, um, there, were, there were better relationships. I mean, I, I, a Democratic Senate chairman say, I, he had been to the family quarters under both Bushes, as well as Clinton, mm -hmm. not on this one. And that, that there is, there, I mean, go around the Hill and ask members of Congress, what kind of, how often do you have any kind of interaction at all with the president? And you would find it's shockingly small. Maybe it's just because I just finished reading the, the Cairo book on Lyndon Johnson, but Ronald Reagan came to town. He didn't know a soul when he got to Washington, but he had the personal skills and the desire to build relationships and, and, and to, to, to work. You mentioned waiting for the president to say, I've made some mistakes, here's what I'm going to do different. Didn't he attempt that in the first debate in his closing statement? He said something about how I'm not a perfect president, and he was massively yeah, but that's a My ears perked up. I was waiting to say, Right, oh, well, specifically. Right? You're saying you didn't finish the well, statement, to, to basically. Say, you know, and I think what they do want to hear him, it's not so much, oh, boy, I really messed up on the economy, didn't I? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was bad. That would be a winning argument, um, yeah. It is, you know what, I came to Washington. I really wanted to institute change. I thought I could do this. It's really hard. I need to do a better job of it, you know? And um, I think people are willing to listen to that. Now, he also has to believe that and say that to the people on the on the Hill, both on the Republican and the Democratic side. But this sense of like, you know, things are going to change because they have to, right? We can't go through another four years with a paralyzed Washington. And that's what, again, for all the people in Denver and Virginia that I've listened to, where the economies are better, they aren't giving the president much credit because they think that he failed on that measure. Quick related question is if, if people are reluctant to embrace the president for a second term because of, uh, of, of gridlock in Washington, are they also reluctant to embrace their incumbent senators and representatives at this moment? No, that hasn't translated. The, the whole system's broken. Charlie's right. That they, they think they're all, you know, they don't like Democrats. They don't like Republicans. They think the system is broken. But there's not a wholesale throw everybody out. Now, partly because I, I think the, I mean, the, listen, the great irony is in 2006, Democrats got into control of the House in large part because they defeated a bunch of moderates, moderate Republicans. Republicans gained control in 2010 by knocking out almost all of the blue dog moderate Democrats. And so voters did believe they were making change, right? They said, throw these bums out, throw these terrible Democrats out, throw these terrible Republicans out. And in their desire to send a message of change, what they created essentially was an even more polarized Congress. Yeah, they threw right? out the wrong so they people. They threw out the very wrong people. <laughs> and that is where, you know, and that's why I also get frustrated when you have, you know, the campaign committee ch chair people of each side saying, oh, Congress is so terrible. And I said, well, yeah, because you beat all those people you could have worked with. You targeted them and painted them with a broad brush. This is just another Bush Republican. This is just another Obama Democrat. Well, you get what you pay for. There is no silver bullet. But if, you, if, if I could wave a magic wand and do two things, redistricting reform 
so that we don't have all these customized districts. You know, these are designed for Democrats, these are designed for Republicans, because when you do that, you get far, far left Democratic districts, far, far right Republican districts. And the other thing is um, um, open up primaries mm -hmm. uh, in states that have closed primaries yep. so the independents can vote either way. California just did both. And we are seeing more competition in California than I would say the previous three decades combined, mm -hmm. just in one year. And it may not be the perfect reform, but I tell you what, you're getting competition and you're having members that have never tried to talk to voters in the other side or independents. Um, you know, you've got two. Uh, you know uh, Sherman and Berman. I mean, you got yeah. You, you know, running to the running to try to meet Republican and independent voters because they're two Democratic incumbents facing off against each other. Um, you're seeing some very interesting things happen, but uh, that would do more to fix Washington than any other two concrete things I can think of. I want to ask about one or two other things, and then I'm going to throw it open to your questions. So have them ready, and I believe there will be a microphone passed around uh, as well. But. First, just a follow-up. Both of you have referred in our conversation to polls. Now, when you refer to what polls are saying, is that before or after you unskew them? <laughs> <laughs> let, you go, me, Charlie, because I know first. you have. Uh, I, I have very strong, very strong opinions. Very strong about opinions these. on this. Should I just explain this for the C-SPAN audience? Yeah, We're ahead. talking about the allegation among some that the polls are skewed, that they were showing Obama ahead when he wasn't, and there are websites that are now adjusting the polls. Uh, Jonathan Martin of Politico referred to a choose-your-own-adventure campaign where you can decide who's ahead, who's behind. You can make your own poll. You can have your own debate winner. Actually, yesterday I saw uh, a video going around where you can even rearrange the debates to have the argument go the way that you wish. Well, anyway, and, go ahead. And, and actually, and, and uh, Rasmussen has a uh, subsidiary pulse research or something where you could actually go online with a credit card and give them your credit card, write a question, and it'll get asked on a robo poll oh. the next night. Uh, which I'm not sure why I even decided to bring that up because I probably shouldn't have. A little frightening. Actually. But anyway, but here is sort of the, to me the common sense. Number one, cherry picking people who think that they go for the one poll that tells them what they want to hear and that's obviously the most accurate poll and any, th any other poll is obviously methodologically flawed. So the cherry picking is a sin. The other, and which is worst among cable bookers, uh, is the latest poll. Well, the latest poll must be the truth. Now, even if it's inconsistent with 10 other surveys, but they seize on the latest one. And then the third, and the way to combat that, is to go with aggregation, where they average a bunch of, of polls together. But the problem is, if half the polls that are going into the average are, um, I come up with, what is my acronym? Computerized Response Attitudinal Poll. Check the initials. <laughs> uh, where they're either internet or robo polls. Uh, a computer is asking the questions rather yeah, than yeah, a live Yeah, 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 where they're not, they can't call cell they phone They can't call users. cell phones. That's the big piece. 30 to 40 percent, some states close to 50 percent of respondents. I mean, you've got huge methodological problems. And so the thing is, if you're averaging garbage in with the good stuff, you're, it's not. So, um, you know, what we've started doing on our website is that we just go through for at least just for the presidential for national polls and, and battleground states and say, okay, we're just going to show polls that are live people calling real people with, with acceptable methodology and putting that on. And the thing is, for conservatives that don't want to trust the liberal media, okay, fine. Why don't you just do this? Watch the Fox poll, because to be perfectly honest, Fox's polling doesn't look much different from the other networks, but that's okay. Just look at Fox and look at the NBC Wall Street Journal. Now, Wall Street Journal, I don't think they're part of the liberal media cabal. And one of the two pollsters that's doing it is, was one of Romney's two pollsters four years ago and is the partner of Romney's current pollster. And so they're probably not in on the, in on the conspiracy. And so just look at those if you don't want to look at any. But the thing is, those look like most of the other of the reputable national phones with uh, polls with live people. And, and, but in the States, you know, the days of the largest newspaper in the state right. commissioning a quality survey research firm to do a real legitimate poll, uh, it doesn't happen anymore. I mean, one of these robo-firms, firm, there was a piece in the New York Magazine a couple weeks ago, 
Uh, it was a three-person firm in North Carolina that puts out over 800 polls a year. 800 polls 800 a year. 800 polls a year. That seems like uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Not ex yeah. Okay. And, and, and the other big robo firm probably has five or ten people. I mean, what would be fun is to actually do an, not just an autopsy of the public polls, but you know, internally you hear different things too, right? I mean, there still are, we don't get to see, we get to hear about, right? The campaigns will tell you, well, we have it this here, we have this there. Um, assumptions that the campaigns, both at the presidential level, the Senate level, are making about what the electorate is going to look like also color the way that they are looking at each of these states. So, uh, which is, you know, but, but again, if you, if you put truth serum into both of the campaigns, they're not going to be that far off. Steve, on pick this. a swing state. Ohio. Ohio. Wow, how'd you pick that? I don't know. I just thought Let's it, see. Came to, it came to mind. Maybe we can pick a more interesting one next. Go Two on. Democratic pollsters. One has it at Obama up by six or seven, one has it up by five. Uh, three Republican pollsters, one has Obama up one, one has Obama up four to six, and one has it even. Sounds like Obama's ahead three or four points. Uh, probably, yeah, it's somewhere between even and seven and probably split the difference, yes. I mean, and, and so by looking at the, the sort of the shoe leather like Amy does and that some of us do, talking to people on both sides, you could kind of, you know, get a feel for where this thing probably is based on high quality research. And, and would you recommend that people, uh, as Nate Silver, the New York Times might recommend, uh, look at these state polls rather than looking at national polls? No. You, no? Because 90% of the state polls are robo or internet. Because the Very, quality is not there. The quality is right. not there. Now when you see the CBS New York Times Quinnipiac, that's a, that's a good poll. Okay. The NBC Wall Street Journal Marist, uh, that's a good poll. Uh, the Des Moines Register has their own. <clears throat> Joanne Seltzer does that. She also does the Bloomberg poll. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, there is some high-quality live people calling live people, uh, uh, but it's very, very little, and that's what pollutes the averages. And whether it's pollster.com or whether it's um, 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 uh, Real, Real Clear Point. Politics or Talking Points Memo or, or in Nate. Nate's a really bright guy, but, you know, I, I think you, you need to be a little more discriminating in terms of what polls you're plugging into this thing, because otherwise it's garbage in, garbage out. Given that we are, this is the last question before we go to your questions, given that we are in a choose your own adventure environment, uh, tell, me, tell me your instinct. It's a very close election. Presume that it remains a very close election. Do you think that the public at large of the losing side, whoever that might be declared to be, is going to be prepared to accept <coughs> losing? No. No, certainly it's going to feel very different than it did in 2008, where McCain voters, they certainly wanted their guy to win, but also, you talk to a lot of them, they say, boy, on that election night, right, you sort of felt a sense of, we just made, you know, America just made history here. There was that hopeful moment, you saw the president's numbers spike up right after the inaugural, right direction, wrong track, spiked up, everything went up, and then, of course, it crashed back down to earth. So that patina has now been completely wiped off. Now the real question is, is it going to feel like 2004 where there's the frustration and the hand wringing and the, oh, I can't be you know, believe this from Democrats? Or is it going to be like 2000 where we get to the position of, well, this race was stolen. It's absolutely, this is an illegitimate president. Um, and that's going to come down to, you know, are we going to have another hanging chad piece of all of this? Is it going to be Voters as close? Away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and even in 04, as close as that was, I mean, I had a bunch of some lefties emailing me, you know, that it was, the election was stolen. I mean, you're going to have deniers. In any close race, there are going to be some grassy knoll deniers that are just willing, not willing to accept losing. And that's just part of where society is, yeah. that um, there, it just it is what it is. But it sounds like you're talking about perhaps something a little larger than that. Is a, there's a potential of that. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, two, I mean, I was just saying even 2004, which was a close race, but about as cut and dried as a close day, race yeah. could possibly be. But there were people that were, were, were saying that, uh, you know, Ohio was stolen from Kerry. Wow. Yeah. I'm happy. But we are more polarized even than then, yes. than that date, yes. than 2004. Yes. Okay. So, yes, the intensity is much more. 
Okay, let me invite your questions. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'll be calling, uh, calling on you. If you would stand up so that people can see you and also say your name and uh, where you're Tell from. Tell us a little bit so, about yourself. Exactly, so we learn a little bit about you. And I'll start in the back row. Someone well, raise your hand right back it. there. Oh. Go right ahead, sir. Yes. No, you, that's you. Thanks. Hi, Will Davis with the United Nations. And Steve, first off, the whole reason I listened to Morning Edition can be summarized by the fantastic story from Dakar, Senegal this morning about the sheep <laughs> beauty contest. Puts a spring in my step for the whole day. A story for, about sheep. Did ABC have a story about yeah, sheep? Yeah, you didn't, know, didn't catch we one just no, anyway, sir, that. No, 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 no. Thank you, thank you. But for, for Charlie well, and Amy. Darton is an, ex uh, is an excellent correspondent, yeah. The Senate, going to be very close. Who's going to control it, and which two or three races will it come down to? Charlie, you go first. <laughs> um, if you were a Republican a year and a year, well, we were saying a year, year and a half ago, Republicans had a 60, 70 percent chance of, of picking up uh, a majority in the Senate. I try not to use control, because in the Senate, that's a number that begins <laughs> in a six. It usually doesn't, doesn't end in a zero. But, uh, um, but they, they've had some tough breaks. I mean, whether it was uh, uh, Olympia Snow's retirement or Todd Aiken becoming a biology instructor, uh, <laughs> although that actually race is still pretty close, actually, and, and some, some Republicans that I thought were first-rate uh, candidates not panning out so well, like Linda Lingle in Hawaii and Heather Wilson in, in, in New Mexico. Um, I, I think it's about a 40% chance of Republicans taking a majority. Uh, but I think it's going to be a lot of one, two-point races so that I, I would not be surprised if uh, Wednesday lunchtime, mm -hmm. we, may, we may not be positive. Remember, four, six years ago, the last time this group of Senate seats were up, you had uh, Missouri, Montana, and Virginia uh, still, up, still up for grabs. Right. And that was majority of the Senate. And, and in those three states, four, uh, my Senate editor, Jennifer Duffy, figured this out. 4.8 million people voted in those three states, and those three states were decided by 60,600 total votes, and there was majority of the Senate. I think we could be in that kind of situation, but it's uh, basically once you move Nebraska, the, the Nelson open seat from the Democratic side to the Republican side, and that's, that's a done deal. Basically, Republicans need three if they win the White House, four if, or two if they win the White House, three if they don't, if Nebraska's moved over, and you have five Democratic toss-ups, five Republican toss-ups. And keep in mind that, that those last group of toss-up states, they usually don't split down the middle. They have a tendency to break two-thirds, one way or the other. It's kind of like dominoes. And if you think about it, you know, let's say their one-point race is just this last little gust of wind, then they typically break one way or the other. So. Um, you know, Democrats have an advantage, but I'd say there's 40% chance of Republicans getting it. Yeah, and I think uh, if you if you want to know who has control of the Senate, I mean, some of the early majority. states. I'm sorry, majority. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, you know, Virginia certainly is a is a place to go, right? So if if Republicans win Virginia, I would argue there's a very good chance that they won the Senate, even if they lose Massachusetts, even if they lose Maine, because it would suggest to the two-thirds point that they're winning in states where it was really close, but maybe Romney came over the top, right? So then they win in North Dakota, Montana, Nebraska, right? And maybe they do pick up I don't know what to think about Wisconsin, but that's another one that's sort of tilting. If, People often say that about Wisconsin, yes. but go on, I'm what, sorry. What to you? <laughs> Um, says the guy from Indiana. Yes, the yes, guy that from was Indiana. a nice little yes. jab. People at, don't think about Indiana. Actually, no, they do. I do. I do. I do. Anyway. So, um, so that really, to me, is is the state that will tell us the most. If there's a theme in the Senate races this year, it's people in very close races in really nasty states for their yeah, side. Yep. And whether it's Scott Brown, a Republican in, in Massachusetts, or Heide Heidekamp in North Dakota, or uh, or Joe, Joe Donnelly, Donnelly in Indiana, or you know Linda Lingle in Hawaii. I mean, it's a bunch of people, and, and and I think of it as you know, it's like you could have an Olympic gold medal winning swimmer, but how bad can the undertow get before they get sucked under? And and you take Massachusetts, where uh, Brown's got to basically win 100% of the Republican vote and 100% of the Independent vote, and one out of five Democrats or when every Romney voter plus maybe 200,000 Obama supporters have to split their tickets. 
Wow, that's really hard. But that goes to the point too. I mean, if all those people did win, the Senate would look very different, right? Because they are opposite parties in a very, right? In, in states that don't traditionally elect somebody from their party. So they would have to be those down the middle, need to compromise kind of people. And it would suggest, I mean, this is where Massachusetts is, is a great case study because if Scott Brown loses, he's gonna lose with very high positives. People like him, he's not gonna lose because people think he's a terrible person or did a terrible job. They'll just say, well, I don't really like the idea of Republicans having control of the Senate. Okay, but weren't you, the, didn't you That's want where it'd be nice to be a parliamentary system yeah. where you could kind of, a party could pick somebody up and put them someplace where they could actually win. You know, when you have an extraordinarily good candidate in a really ugly place. Let's go over to this side of the room. Yes, ma'am, please, right here in the second row. Hi, I'm Gweta Mazzetti. I worked on the Hill, and I sit on these task forces at DOD. Um, a couple of things, if you can bear with me. I did voter protection in Ohio. What's going on with voter protection, and how much of a difference do you think that's going to – I mean, there were horrible horror stories, people dumping ballot boxes in the river and delivering 30 voting machines where there were supposed to be 10 and vice versa. So what's the sense of that? And then my second question is um, – you mentioned that people have to sort through who Romney is, and a very important question for those of us who live here is, is Romney going to control the Tea Party, or is the Tea Party going to control Romney? And, uh, you know, sorting through that is difficult for those of us inside the Beltway, but certainly outside the Beltway, one would hope that the Obama uh, campaign had made that particular point, particularly in high intellectual states like Massachusetts or someplace else. Are they doing that out there? I, I mean, I saw Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown go back and forth in a debate talking about control of the Senate and what that meant. And so is the Obama administration, we don't have access to advertisements like you can see across the country. Are they doing something to define it that way out there? Because the president really does need um, some control over the Tea Party. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the first question about voter protection. What, what, what's the battle look like there? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I just will, I will say this. Every year there are problems in every single state with voting. Those of you who go to voting places know primarily what those problems involve. There are nice, sometimes elderly, most often elderly people whose task it is to help people get to their voting place. Sometimes, I remember there was a year in Montgomery County, nobody really taught them how to turn on the machines, right? So people showed up to vote, the machines weren't turned on. This was not a conspiracy to, to deny people the right to vote. This was the fact that a lot of nice people had no idea how to work a, a machine. That is 99% of what goes on at this. Every year we put people, we task them to be ballot watch. Watch out for what's happening. We got reports of any problems anywhere. Every year somebody runs out of ballots in some county, some jurisdiction. Every year there are, there are debates, usually in big cities, about should the polls be open later because the lines are too long. And um, at the same time, we know that the following things will happen. There will be mistakes made. There will be votes miscounted. There will be things that, you know, oh, wow, we found these absentee ballots on the bottom of the, this you know, room that we, didn't, uh, we forgot to check. That is going to happen, but I'm going to tell you that it's 99.999% about honest to goodness mistakes. It's not malice. Okay. I could. Can I? Can I? Yeah, please. I couldn't agree with Amy more that what you've got. Most counties spend more money on food in the county jail than on administering elections. Okay. So we get all the accuracy that we pay for. You want it down, you want precision, we're going to have to spend a whole lot more. But basically you have a system that's based on part-time, temporary, oftentimes elderly workers using new technology. Now, <laughs> <laughs> we love all of those people. Think about it. And, 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 and sure, they're going to be, you know, they're the acorn people on one side or this clown in Virginia that was, I mean, look, it's a big country. There are going to be examples of that. But there is not a serious voter fraud problem in this country, widespread. I mean, in the Bush administration, in eight years, they found fewer than one case per state per year for all 50 states. Now, that's 
pretty negligible. And, and this is not, it's, it's, it's people that want to deny, it's people that will not accept that they lose elections. You either win or it's stolen from you. And, and I, I, you know, believe what you want to believe, but this, in the scheme of problems in this country, this is way down the list as far as I'm concerned. And so you put voter fraud, you said specifically, which is a more Republican than Democratic concern, way down the list. Voter suppression, which is what Democrats have talked about. Would you also put that down the list? I think running ads to try to depress the supporters for the other side is something that virtually every competent campaign in both parties in competitive races do. You want to get your people out and you want to have give your opponent's supporters conflicting emotions so that they, maybe they stay home. And, but that's and, conventional voter suppression, not some mechanical thing, changing the rules, voter ID, that, that kind is, of stuff you're not worried about. pretty darn like. rare. Pretty darn rare. It's, it's great. It's great. For, I mean, uh, it's, it's so, so, the, so the vote stealing that is of concern to partisans, you feel, will be overwhelmed by the normal human errors of, of the election. Of, of, right. Okay. All right. Over on this side. Yes, sir. Right here in the third row. Hi, my name is Doug. I'm with the Aspen Institute. Uh, both of you are expert um, election watchers of the highest caliber, so I was wondering if you can talk a bit about super PACs, what impact they've had on the election, and the new world of campaign finance. No, no, it, um, I, I can't wait for the, the real autopsy when all is said and done about this. Um, but as I said a, a little bit earlier, you know, the amount of money that's being spent, especially on the Republican side, has been astronomical. And it is the only reason why Mitt Romney is not getting outspent by a greater margin, especially in these battleground states. At the same time, flooding money into the system as an outside group is not always particularly helpful. First of all, um, you know, no matter how smart these groups are, and they believe me, they're a heck of a lot smarter than the outside groups that used to be, which used to be much more ideological, right? They had a cause and they were going to spend a jillion dollars even if it was on some crazy thing, you know, like, we need more jello in schools. That's what we're going to care about. We're going to make that the focus of our campaign. Um, now it's, they are strategic. They have their own polling. They have their own media shops. They think they know, okay, here's how we need to move voters to our candidate, right? This is how we have to help Mitt Romney, even though we can't coordinate with Mitt Romney. But what they're seeing and what they're focused on is oftentimes completely different than what the campaign wants it to be, right? So you have very conflicting messages, which is not always helpful to the candidate. But the most important thing is that they have to spend more money to get an ad on TV. There's something called the lowest unit rate. So if you're a candidate, first of all, a TV station has to give you space. They don't have to give it to an independent group. And you get a lower, it costs less to be a candidate. So you're having in some places, uh, and, and then there's a whole other complicated thing about if you buy early and reserve, but anyway, buying ad time isn't much different from anything else you purchase where you want to look for bargains, you want to be smart and, and strategic about it. When they go in to have to buy ads, they're spending sometimes 10 times as much as a campaign. They're paying retail while the campaigns pay wholesale. There we go. Much better way of saying that. Of course, because it's Charlie. So all that is to say is that uh, they have made an impact, but at the end of the day, they didn't do the one thing that we both agree could have helped Mitt Romney, at least early on, which was defining him, as opposed to letting him be defined. I mean, there were lots and lots of ads out there saying that President Obama was a terrible candidate, terrible you know, steward of the economy. People already knew that. What they didn't know about was who Mitt Romney was. And then finally, I think, you know, if, the, this, the Senate is another b big piece of this, right? After all said and done, if all these Republican super PACs that supposedly were gonna, they were going to buy this election, if, if Mitt Romney does not win and if Republicans don't take control of the Senate, that's not a really good return on investment, right? And so I'll be very curious to see what the reaction is going to be like from some in those circles. Yeah, it, it's not new for very, very wealthy people to have uh, a dis through spending disproportionate influence. And whether you want to go back to the 72 or well before that, or, you know, Soros and Peter Lewis, uh, you know, I mean, it, it happens in, yep. you know, one election that will be on one side and another election will be on the other. But you're, you're right, it's, it's not quite as efficient a spending as some other spending. I mean, do I wish the, the Supreme Court had not uh, call, 
call, could, uh, decided that uh, uh, campaign spending is a form of speech? Um, sure. But uh, the super PACs were a logical extension of, of that decision. It is what it is, and frankly, I don't think there's a lot we could do about it. So, you know, but, but I think it's right that is that if, this wa if money was determinative, then a that lot of different people would be in elective office now. <laughs> uh, and, and, but what it did do, I think the most concrete thing it did this time, is it extended the Republican nomination fight is that uh, the, the super PACs for, uh, for Santorum kept him going, for Gingrich kept yeah. him going, even, you know, Romney during a couple of uh, thin patches financially, he sort of got sort of mezzanine financing that extended, you know, but th that race would have been over a lot sooner had it not been for super PACs. Let me ask a follow-up question before we go back to questions from the audience. You mentioned again the idea that the Romney campaign made what you see as a mistake in not defining him early, spending a lot of money to explain to people who he was. Surely at some point you've asked people from the Romney campaign about this. Um, what explanation have they offered? Have they said, calm down, we know it's not conventional, but here's what we've been trying to do. We want to be focused, we want to be disciplined. Um, uh, we dial tested it and it didn't move the meter. Um, oh, meaning they had is, the ads, but they the, didn't work. This is about the economy. Mm -hmm. This is this is an election fundamentally about the economy. This is a referendum on the the president, and, see, a, and that they will also say, and we didn't have the kind of resources that the president did. So, you know, we're going to get outspent two or three or four to one, regardless of what ad we put up there. They were still going to get the heft, right? That's the problem with being a challenger is you don't get to go in. I had you know the campaign will say, look. We had to fight off these six other people in a primary while President Obama got to ro roll together all this cash and then just dump it. Now, it, might, it also might not have worked, right? I mean, that was the, this is the gamble that both sides made. The Obama campaign gambling that defining Romney early was going to define this race. And if they lose, then obviously the gamble did not pay off. And Romney's was, well, first we've got to get through the primary. But the other is, this is going to be, this is a, a race about the fundamentals, and the fundamental is that one guy is president of the United States at a time of incredible economic despair, and that's what we will be focused on. I think there's a view that, you know, this is going to be a referendum up or down on President Obama and the economy, and and I think it's a little more complicated than that. To me, it's it's people are asked, do you want to renew this president's contract for another four years? Yes, no, or maybe. And if the no and maybe combined equal 50% or more, which it has, mm -hmm. then a second question, do you feel comfortable replacing the president with Mitt Romney? And they just view this first part of the equation as important. And, and not, it would determine that part, and, right? And not the second. My view was I thought the American people would know that the economy sucked without any help from the <laughs> oh, Romney campaign. And I think they kind of figured That's it out. That's an economic actually. term. But, uh, but it's a political science it's term. Irish. Oh, political science term also. Uh, okay, fine. It's, it's, uh, um, but, but it's one of they, his acronyms. It, it, um, uh, they wanted to stay focused and disciplined, but, but that's, which, which leads it to then why didn't the super PACs come in and they and said, that's that. not our job. But yeah, yeah. And, and, and in fact, actually, um, um, Restore Our Future, the Pro Romney Super PAC, actually had a really nice testimonial spot that I thought was really good, but they only ran it for a while. They stopped running it on May 27th, and I think they popped back they up. They popped a week back up, yeah, because it, yeah. Does what you said also explain Romney's uh, debate performance in the foreign policy debate on Monday, where he seemed restrained, where he seemed even to adjust his positions? Is that basically the campaign thinking, we don't want Mitt Romney to get in the way of the message here, which is the economy? Well, that's not his lane, and I think he decided to take that one pass-fail, and he passed. Um, you know, that was a lower risk, and, and uh, um, I think it worked fine for him. I mean, the thing is, I don't think he needed, I don't think he was going to win a foreign policy debate. I mean that's not an area that is his 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 area of expertise, and and um, so I think he just opted to go a low a low low risk strategy. Okay, let me ask the gentleman uh, in the bow tie here in the front row, sir. Hi, uh, Bill Nitsa with Oceania Energy and uh, on the board of the institute. I want to pick up on an earlier question about Romney's shift to the center. Because, although I'm not an undecided voter, if I were, 
And if I really believed that Romney would be willing to take on the right wing of his own party to arrive at pragmatic compromises with centrist Democrats, that would have a big effect on my vote. My hunch is he would sort of like to do that. But my other hunch is he's a hostage to fortune. And he's not going to be able to get Grover Norquist off his back so easily. But I'd be very interested in your sense of who is the real Mitt Romney, and if it is what I hope it might be, why he doesn't say so more directly. Well, I would argue that, first of all, you can make the same statement about President Obama. Yeah. And that, you know, I think there are a lot of ideologues that believe that compromise is a four-letter word in both parties. And I'd say it's over half of the members in each party in Congress are qualified in, in, in that. But, but and, and actually, there was a, the other question earlier about the Tea Party. I mean, first of all, this Tea Party business, what, less than a third of the freshmen joined the Tea Party. I mean, less than a third. And I mean, when, when given the choice, less than a third, I think it's 19, is that right? It's 19 like freshmen. Leadership. No. House leadership. John Boehner and the Tea Party? No, maybe the White Wine Party. The Merlot. Yeah. It's Merlot. And, and I don't really consider, I don't consider Eric Cantor or Boehner Tea Party either. Uh, I mean, I think Cantor's more conservative than Boehner is. But the thing about it is, I mean, you're basically taking an old wine called conservative Republicans and putting a new label on it, call them Tea Party. The Tea Party movement, to my, best I can tell, I don't think it exists anymore. I can't remember the last time I saw a three-cornered ad. I mean, it's, but we've had conservative Republicans for a really long time. And, you know, find me a Tea Party voter you know, th that voted for Obama in 08. Find me one. Or that voted for, for John Kerry in 04 or for, for Al Gore in 2000. You know, there aren't any, or aren't, aren't, aren't many. But, but um, no, I think will, 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 uh, would a President Romney uh, be able to stand up to the more conservative elements in his party? Good question. Uh, could President, would President Obama stand up on entitlement changes and domestic spending? I mean, I think we're looking at just two sides of the same coin, and they're right. both problematic. Uh, and the voters get the, well, and voters get the joke, and that's the, that's the problem, right? And that's where we keep coming back to who's going to be able to do that work. And so, I mean, to your point about, you know, he's now, he's now tacking to the center, now we have moderate Mitt. Remember, this is the Mitt Romney that the Obama campaign did not want to face, right? They didn't want to make this race about the flip-flopping Mitt Romney, because ultimately, a lot of people would say, who they needed to get on their side, well, he doesn't look that bad, right? He's not that conservative. They needed him to be extreme Mitt Romney, the severely conservative Mitt Romney, which is why these ads, I mean, when you look at the most over-the-top negative ads, have come from Barack Obama, not from Mitt Romney. These ads, are the, most of you sit in the Washington, D.C. media market, you've seen the ads with the woman saying, you know, basically, I will not have contraceptive and I, and I will get cancer and die because of Mitt Romney, right? I mean, that's essentially what they're saying, because he's going to cut off Planned Parenthood. So they can't let him be the kind of like, he says this one way and says this another way. That's not the argument that they want. They want to make the extreme argument, which is why I think you saw him at this debate the other day, doing it for both reasons. One, it's not his, it's not his territory, and he didn't need to get, uh, get himself tripped up in, in, in this debate. But also because those very women he's trying to talk to, they don't, he doesn't want to be a George Bush, right? He didn't want to be put into the category of he's just a George Bush neocon or he's beating the war drums, right? So he distanced himself from almost all of that as well. And one of the first things he said in that debate was, we don't want to see another Iraq, right? This is, this is well, sort of remarkable. It raises a larger question that I mean, Mitt Romney 1.0 could not possibly have won a Republican nomination, okay? Some of you are Democrats, half the room are Democrats. Let's think about 2016 for a second. You know, a lot of people in this room, I suspect, think Mark Warner is pretty good. You know what his chances of winning a Democratic nomination are? Zero. Zero. It's the same thing that these parties have gotten so ideological that you can't, you know, that was actually what was so remarkable, I think, about the uh, Obama-Clinton race was that it wasn't a race to the left. I mean, it was generational, it was social economic, mm -hmm. it was, I mean, mm -hmm. it was a lot of things, but it wasn't about ideology. 
But I think that, that, that sort of the specifics of that race sort of masked a larger thing. The Democrats have the same problem. Okay, let me ask a related question to follow up on the questions that people asked. Uh, there is a, a saying that regardless of what you believe as a politician, you will have to govern as you campaign. There must be some relationship. If you buy that notion, how would each of these guys have to govern given the way that they have campaigned? Well, given the fact that they've demagogued on two issues that we know they're going to have to deal with in the immediate future, entitlements and taxes, right? So th they're going to have to make that um, they're going to have to make that change. Look, they're gonna, their hand is in some ways forced already, whether they want to do it or not. We have the fiscal cliff coming up. We have the reality of sequestration. So they're going to deal with it one way or the other. The question is, how ugly does it get? Now, I didn't read the whole piece today. There was a, uh, the Des Moines Register noted uh, l late last night that they had an interview with the president that he wanted to be off the record, and they complained it shouldn't be off the record, and now suddenly it's now on there website, but I think that's one of the points that the president makes too about how it's going to be pretty ugly, the fight, but that's what's going to have to happen. Well, and I was talking to a Republican House member the other day where they had a conference phone call, conference call, and apparently they were asked, and I don't know specifically whether it was Boehner or Cantor or McCarthy or who, but basically in terms of the but, don't commit to anything. Basically don't commit. Just say as little as you possibly can on this because, you know, things are going to have to happen after this election. And, and you know, I, I think hopefully after the election, sort of the adults sort of yep. take over on both sides because obviously some things have to happen or some pretty ugly things happen on December 31st. I, and I think they, th those conversations are happening. I mean, folks that I talk to on both sides seem pretty committed to the fact that leadership is going to be, at least right now, they're talking in a way that suggests that they do not want to see another um, debt ceiling sort of meltdown. And, and the Senate side, I think it's very plausible that some kind of a compromise gets worked out. The House is just very, very problematic. You've got just a lot of really exotic members <laughs> on the right That's, and the left. We call that a euphemism. Yeah. Not that yeah, there's anything wrong yeah, with that. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, mm -hmm. that are gonna, they're pretty hard to get those people to the same table. Okay. Uh, we got time for two or three more questions. How about here on the aisle, sir, in the second row? Hi. Bob Lawrence from Holman and Lawrence. We've had a lot of detailed analysis about the three debates and the impact that it's had on the election or might have on the election. But if I have this right, there was actually four debates. Is there any analysis or views about what the vice presidential debate? I mean, I think the vice presidential debate did give a boost to a very depressed Democratic Party that you know came out of that first one wringing their hands and oh this is over it's a disaster Eeyore came out right with the head swinging I can't believe this but it didn't have it didn't have an impact on the actual numbers themselves in part because you know voters are still picking the president they're not picking the running mate and so it was a good morale boost for a Democratic Party that needed one but Beyond that, I don't think it had much of an impact. I thought the network should have a disclaimer. This debate is for entertainment purposes only <laughs> and will have no bearing whatsoever on the outcome of the election. And, and it was, but, but Amy's right that you had, after the president's performance the first time, and I love Jay Leno's line that the only people that thought the president won the first debate were the NFL replacement ref. <laughs> uh, but then you had a bunch of Democrats that were standing on the window ledge, and Biden got him off the ledge and got him back into the room into safety. And, and, so, and Ryan, you know, Republicans were obviously worried that, you know, yeah. Medicare or Social Security or education would blow up, and it didn't. And, didn't, and so. so I think both sides were very, very relieved with how the vice presidential debate went. Okay, one or two more questions. Um, maybe in the back somewhere. Okay, the gentleman right here on the, also on the aisle with the glasses. Go right ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Fernando Batista. I'm an independent consultant. Um, I have kind of a longish question, but I'm gonna make it, make it short. Short is good. The first one is <laughs> going back to the, uh, the debates in general and substance versus style versus the shaping by the media. Um, I, I've talked to some people and I've heard even on interviews that people when they heard Obama's uh, re retorts 
they've done more specifics mm -hmm. versus um, Governor Romney's statements. So that's one. The other one is the issue of terms, limits. Wouldn't it be better to have a six-year president so that they could just have one short campaign? Um, Jimmy Carter had that idea years ago. How'd that work out for him? Yeah. <laughs> Six-year term limit was the question. Uh, and your other question was about, about the debates, about who was more specific, who was more particular? My guess is if you ask Democrats, they'll say that President Obama was more specific, and you ask Republicans, and they'll say Mitt Romney was more specific. And if you ask independents, they probably didn't make it all the way through most of the debates. The, the, uh, right. And um, two things. First, on the six-year term limit, it would just mean we'd have longer campaign seasons. There's no way, and we'll spend more money on it. It will vacuum will be filled, right? So I don't doubt that for a minute. But, but to, to Charlie's point, beyond the partisans that would just say my guy won, you know, regardless of what happened except for the first debate, it is very different to go through and like the dork that I am, read the transcript of the debate, especially the first debate, and then watch it. It's a very different debate, right? It's the same, it's the whole Nixon. If you listen to it on the radio, you thought Nixon won. If you watched it on TV, you thought Kennedy won. So style does matter, and I think that's where, you know, for the, for the vast majority who even tuned in for five seconds, what they saw was a president who just didn't seem like he wanted to be there. And again, for a president who was already sort of teetering on the Charlie's question of no, maybe, you know, will I, do I want to see him back? It sure did not make them feel like they're going to, you know, change their minds on the no, maybe part. So, um, so style is important. That's why these guys spend almost as much time learning about which camera to look at. What kind of face do you have? Unless right? you're going on a tour of Hoover Dam. What is that Explain about? that, yeah. Oh, dear, the president skipped one of the debate prep sessions to go to Hoover Dam. Oh, well, that was the first one. Yeah, but. yeah. Who doesn't want to see the Hoover Dam? But right? it's gonna. The thing is, it's been there for a while. It's It'll gonna, still be there. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, I guess that's so. That's a post-presidency tourist visit. Yeah, but. I guess that's right. Okay, one more question. Uh, how about you, ma'am? Right here. Please go right ahead. Yeah, right here, second row. Yeah. Okay. Microphone's coming to you. Oh, thanks. Um, Gloria did us. So you two are as dialed in as anyone I know. Um, what's going to be the big surprise uh, when we wake up the day after the election? That it's not over. That's which is always true. First of all, who gets to wake up? Uh, um, I, we will not have slept. Yeah. So um, that there's that. Beyond there's the, the first to sell it back from be, New York. Yes, yeah. that's the question number one. But. Um, you know, look, there's always some house candidate that loses we didn't expect, but it just seems in this day and age, if there is a surprise, it is something that literally broke like the day before, right? But, um, you know, are, is there going to be, are, are you thinking about like in a, at the presidential you know, Senate race? Well, you know, we're always chasing after, you know, you hear this, you hear this, you know, try to figure out if there's, anything to it and after every shocking upset I can usually think back to some conversation uh -huh. I had with someone somewhere who suggested we're thinking about they a always said that, in right. Iowa and <laughs> right and they always say it it's sort of offhand but but there were 67 other racers that say, oh you better watch that one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then so nothing happens right oh you should watch like this that. one so that you know the one that well, let's say take this morning we're Democrats, the uh, Democratic, was it Senate Majority PAC? The Democratic Super PAC? Yeah. Uh, they just went up on the air in Pennsylvania right. for Bob Casey. Uh, not a race that we've considered particularly competitive. There have been a bunch of polls that have shown it close up, but most of them were polls of, shall we say, dubious credibility. Uh, so do you believe it or not? And so, you know, we're going to spend today trying to chase down, figure out whether the Pennsylvania Senate race is competitive or not. But there, we're, we're chasing these things all the time, and who the heck knows which one ends up, ends up being the one. Well, maybe that's a good point to uh, stop this. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. I feel like I learned a lot. Thank you very much.